Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm sitting here with the rather wonderful Mr. Rich Chicky. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. How about you, Warren? I'm good. I'm sitting in Los Angeles and it's about, I don't know, it's hot. It's a hot day. I was thinking the one question I've never asked a producer, engineer, and mixer of, of, of famous bands, is it really any different working with incredible, you know, musicians like Rush, you know, in a studio working with them? I don't mean on their abilities, I mean personalities, than working with just, say, a local band. Rush in particular, there was a spectacular camaraderie in the studio. So the great thing about Ru- Rush, and, and I've been really fortunate with, with the bands that I, I've worked with, that we never really had anything in particular. The band doesn't have anything to prove. You know, a band like Rush, they've sold, I don't know how many, 50 million records, say? Let's say 50 million for the sake of argument. They've sold 50 million records, and their recording is just to express themselves. It's not a function of trying to prove anything. They love their fans. Their fans love them. They have that symbiotic relationship. So really, the process in the studio is the only quote-unquote pressure is is a creative one where it's like, okay, what are we going to do? How am I going to push myself? Where do we want to go? And in that respect, you know, it's it's been great. And I've found that with a lot of the bands that I work with, whether it's Mick Jagger and you've worked with Aerosmith, that, you know, they just do their thing. You know, Stephen, Stephen gets behind the mic, right? And when he sings, he just, he does that thing that, that he's known for. And the one thing that I, that I, that I will say for any of those type of bands, is this something that they have to work to assemble? How do they, you know, what gives the Aerosmith sound? I tell you, first time I heard Steven Tyler get behind a microphone and start to sing, it was just like, it was like, it's an album. That's it. That's what he sounds like. Right. And 95% of the stuff he would do was amazing. It's just kind of, well, what flavor do you want for that vocal? And it was all there, right? So it, it was, it was, it's uncanny that they have their strengths so controlled that they could just call them up whenever they want. You know, that, that's, and that's something that I found that was the biggest thing for established bands versus young ones. And what about personality-wise? Are you finding you're navigating differently? Or do you find it's pretty much the same kind of level of psychology from like a maybe an up and coming band with an established one? From a personality point of view, being being respectful, whether it's a uh, a younger artist or an established one, I think is important. Uh, the only thing that I I will say is the concept of being say starstruck. As an engineer, uh, you always have to focus on your work. Keep keep an eye on what's going on. If there's an issue, a technical issue, is I get it fixed, get it fixed fast. But I think that applies to anyone. And, you know, certainly with an artist that's more established, that's something that they're going to really be expecting, right? So it's it's really how they more view this side as opposed to how I view that side. And, you know, we just leave, you know, any of the the stardom gets checked at the door and it, you know, everyone's just musicians and doing their thing. Well, give us a little bit of a background. How did you get into these rooms working with these incredible talents? I started my career off uh, playing uh, guitar in uh, doing sessions and then recording. You know, I, I wanted to get a record deal and, uh, and I was sending my work out that I was recording myself. Um, this is, this really predates, you know, the great work that you're doing and what, uh, you know, any of the music schools that are out there in general, you know, any any education was really done by chain of command and and studio. For me, I, you know, I, w- I was just reading, reading books. Um, the distributor for uh, SSL consoles in Canada, he, uh, you know, I just said I wanted to learn how to use an SSL. And he just said, well, come on down, pick up some manuals. You know, and these things were like, you know, there was the console manual for signal flow that was this big. And then there was the computer manual that was this big. I know, I was looking over there to and, see if I could find one. <laughs> right? And, and and I proceeded to go directly to a, uh, a copying uh, store and do copyright infringement, made a phone book out of both of them, and then I would read this thing. Good started, luck. I was recording. Yeah, it took a long time. <laughs> I started reading about using uh, SSLs and was recording my own music, and I was sending them out to record companies. I wanted to get a record deal, right? Just like everybody else. And I started to get calls uh, about, you know, it's about the music I was doing and, and the and the bands I, I was I was in, and they they started to say, hey, uh, 
where'd you get this done? And I said, oh, I recorded it. And they went, oh, well, cool. Well, listen, uh, you know, we have this band that we're trying to develop. Do you want to do, you want to do th- one of these bands? And, and so I started recording these bands. I'm trying to get a record deal and I'm using, you know, I'm getting record company money to stay alive. And, you know, that started to grow. And then all of a sudden it's, you know, I started to record some things and boom, shows up on a record. And these, you know, these are local uh, Canadian bands. And uh, I started to work with a, a guitar player named Jeff Healy, uh, who is a blind guitar player, really an amazing guitar player. And, uh, you know, his records did did really well. So all of a sudden there was this, I started to get some marquee uh, associated. And then I worked with uh, a gentleman that you might know, Marty Fredrickson. Marty had, was, right, Marty was uh, doing some song, he was a very prolific songwriter. Well, he was working with Jeff Healy. I worked with him together and we had this, uh, we had a, a great uh, uh, relationship in the, uh, in the studio. And he said, hey man, I'll call you sometime. You know, we could do some work together, right? And uh, so about, I don't know, 10 months after we had worked together, he gave me a call and said, uh, hey, you want to come do drums? I love the way you do drums. And uh, I said, sure, I'll come down. And uh, he says, he was in Boston. I said, who's, who's it with? He said, oh, it's with Aerosmith, man. So, you know, that, that was it. And that Aerosmith, uh, the song Jaded, that was like my first uh, number one hit on rock radio in America. And that's just kind of, that's kind of the dividing line in my career. There's all this sort of the things before. And then afterward, it was, you know, it was like Mick Jagger and all the other bands were stacked up. And- Which studio did you record in Boston? We recorded a lot. Uh, Joe Perry had a built. He built a studio, you know. And the funny thing is, is it's it it is the quintessential concept of, you know, home studio. Like he had a, you know, he had a Neve. I know the studio. I've tracked it. The the boneyard. Right. So it's the boneyard. The boneyard. Right. Yeah. Well, that they recorded most of it there. Stephen Tyler also had a home studio. I can't remember what he called it, but he also had a home studio. And then it was mixed at a studio. Another. Uh, home studio nearby that Mike Shipley mixed uh, the album in and they brought an SSL uh, 9000J into this old, old house. <laughs> and that's and that that's, console was so heavy that they had to put uh, uh, reinforcement struts underneath the floor so that the, the house wouldn't cave in. <laughs> so, so it was all done in homes, aside from like the orchestra. I mean, we did orchestra out at, uh, uh, at Ocean Way and, and I can't remember, there was a studio that we recorded in Boston and I can't remember, I just remember it was near Fenway Park, but I can't remember the name of the place. So, so wait, did you, you did all the drums in the boneyard? We tracked drums out at a, uh, at a studio uh, that was, again, it was these, none of these were formal studio environments. So this was recorded at a barn, it, uh, we set up Joey Kramer's studio, uh, his drums out on a uh, live stage that was in a barn. It was all wood, so it sounded spectacular. You know, we had to uh, edit out uh, things like the horses that were underneath. They were underneath the barn, and of course, with Joey hammering on the drums, we you get the horses would be losing their mind from the volume, <laughs> right? So. You know, so we tracked all the drums there, and then we brought everything back to uh, uh, Joe's place and did it there. That's amazing. That sounds like an Aerosmith record. I mean, we <laughs> we, we tracked in their uh, like storage facility, which they had built a studio in, and right. we were still baffling and designing it when just while we were tracking drums. I mean, right? Yeah. <laughs> Vindaloo, Vindaloo, I Vindaloo, think it was called, yeah, right, yeah, Vindaloo. Right. And then went to the boneyard yeah. and I tracked some drums at the bone. But I was asking about that because, of course, the boneyard's quite small. And it doesn't really have a particularly large live room for drums. No, but great for guitars, right? Great for so guitars, we, had, yeah. we had a gr- great time with guitars. Joe, uh, we used a lot of the, uh, I think it's GA30s he was using at the time, the Gibson, you know, and the Gibsons were remarkably simple amps, right? These little 212 combos. And you'd, uh, you know, you just had volume and tone. So it's just kind of like brighter or more. You know, and the rest of it is his hands. I suppose I want to know a bit more about Rush because I think everybody sure. does do. <laughs> sure, sure. Does as well. Um, where were you tracking um, those Rush albums? Were they in Canada? I did some pre-pro for Snakes and Arrows, uh, which was the first studio album that I did with Rush. I, I mixed uh, R30 uh, for them, 
in 2005, I think it was, 2005 I mixed. So you had asked before about how I got involved with Rush. And uh, a friend of mine uh, worked on the management team for quite a long time. And uh, he gave me a call in late 2004. And he said that the uh, the band was going to do a um, part of a charity uh, broadcast because there was, this, there was the huge tsunami in the Middle East, you might recall, in 2004. And uh, uh, Rush was involved in the charity work for that. I got a call. The engineer at the studio, the uh, uh, guy that's on the management team for Rush, told me that the engineer that was slated for the uh, to record the gig was uh, he thought was too too much of a pop engineer. So uh, he asked me if I wanted to sit in and do the uh, do the session. And of course, it's Rush, and uh, you know, I've been a, a long time Rush fan, so it was it was an opportunity I jumped at. And Al Lifeson, of course, one of the funniest guys that I uh, that I've come to know, and we we had such a great time recording that he called me uh, about three months later, and he just said, "Hey, listen, we've recorded this uh, live show for a DVD called R30, and uh, we talked about mixing, and I told him I was going to mix it in Pro Tools, and." He's just, you can't mix in Pro Tools. I thought, oh, a non-believer. So I, uh, I picked up, I literally tore all, the, all my rig and the speakers. I tore it out of my studio, put it in a vehicle, drove it down to his place, set it up, aligned it, right? And then I played him some other surround work that I'd done and just, and it was like he was so freaked out that it was all just coming from a computer with no console that, you know, he just said, well, just mix it here. So I mixed it at his studio. And that was the beginning. That was like kind of the relationship being cemented together and then went on to doing uh, Snakes uh, snakes and Arrows. So you had asked about where Snakes and Arrows was recorded. We did pre-pro in Toronto. And then uh, we went down to a studio in upstate New York called Allaire. Oh, Allaire. Allaire okay. St- yeah. Right, Allaire Studios. And it was a, an amazing uh, residential uh, studio. There was a 9K that was in the studio for us. And we we fed it with just a bunch of Neve. Uh, we just used a bunch of Neve pre's, 1073s, 81s, 84s, 1066s uh, to track. I mixed it on the Neve 88 in uh, Ocean Way. So these days, are you finding yourself uh, mixing a lot in the box? Pretty much 100%. 100%. Last time would be five years ago that I mixed anything that wasn't in the box, and I did it specifically because the artist insisted I could I could achieve better results by mixing in the in in the box. I hate that phrase in the box. I, I think it's you know it's really uh, you know it, it's it's really just a a perception you know. And there's a there there are a lot of digital consoles, and people still refer to them as consoles, but it's strictly cosmetic. The computer, everything is you know the only difference is it's a tactile and it looks like a console but really it's a it's a computer and software and interfaces so speaking of that do you stay entirely inside the computer or do you use any kind of summing and outboard i do experiment with summing occasionally i have a couple uh, i have a couple pieces of outboard that i'll i'll turn to on occasion uh, like a, like a an allen smart uh, c2 comp just it really depends on the music. There's not one of those things where I go, it's better or worse than anything else. There's, there are a number of bus compressors, uh, like the, U, the UA SSL bus compressor. I use a lot, and it sounds it sounds spectacular. So um, I, I have a tendency to uh, use software exclusively. I wonder if you come to the, or you feel the same way. I'm always a little suspicious of piling all of my mix into a stereo digital, you know, at summation and then sticking plugins on it. So if I if I am going to possibly break out in one way, it's usually on the master bus. Yes, I, I'll, I'll agree with that. Having said that, I mean, I've worked with some mastering engineers who have done like hundreds and hundreds of huge, huge, huge records over you know, 30 or 40 years of their career. And I would go to a mastering session and they're all software, dude. They're yep. all software. Yeah. Not 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 exclusively. You know, I mean, there's guys that are doing different things. But when I, you know, when I look at somebody that's done the amount of records that they've done and they, I mean, it's not like it's a huge reach. They have all the analog equipment there. 
they have it there at their disposal. So it's not like it's like, oh my, I have to go out and get this. You know, they'll they'll have the ability just to pull up what they do. And, you know, I mean, I've worked with guys that are hybrid, you know, they have a few, you know, favorite pieces of gear that they always run through, but then there there's tons of dig dig stuff there. And I I think now we're at a point where the uh the equality is there where we're we're all kind of using the same tools now. You know, the, you have kids that can go out and get the, more or less the same tools that you and I use uh, it, it, from a computer perspective. And really now, it, it, it's, it's the ultimate democracy. It comes down to the people that are using it. Mastering in particular, um, well, everything we do, but mastering in particular um, is all about the ears and... Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, last year we went to to hang with Bob Ludwig. You know, you've got Bob who's, you know, still majorly using hardware. And then you go upstairs and hang out with Adam Ayan, who's completely in the box. And they both do incredible work. Both win enough Grammys between them to line the walls. So, you know, it is it is all about the ears. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. 100%. And, and you know, the... Uh, I think that the landscape has changed even more so now than ever, you know, that the landscape has changed that, you know, uh, we're, we're forced to deliver as engineers and mixers, we're forced to deliver more products, more variables within our product, right? Hi, I need these, uh, I need these, uh, all these stems printed. I need to do this, you know, try doing an Atmos mix in, in analog and it's, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. And, but this, these are things that we're called upon. And of course, we're, we, we sit down and say, well, oh yeah. And then there's, there's that budget thing. You know, the, the last analog record I made, I can't tell you how much was spent on accommodations because it's a lot slower. Accommodations for me, I mean, I, I appreciate being in, uh, you know, is being put up in New York for five, you know, four or five weeks. I appreciate that. But it still is something at the end of it that's going to come down from the bottom line of the artist, you know, just printing stems, printing recalls and doing all that stuff. The, the amount of time it would take, you know, I mean, I did a lot of time where I was doing stuff and I'm out shopping because, you know, it would just take forever to do printing in real time. So we've talked a lot about mixing and working in the box. Let's go back to tracking. Is there any kind of both software and hardware that you can't live without when it comes to tracking? First off, I'm, I, let's go with the concept that the source is great. So the artist has got great gear. So they, they sound great. So let's start there. So that's a given just for, for our discussion. That's a given. So microphones, of course, uh, there's, you know, any of the Royers, Mojave's, any of the, any of the classic uh, mics that are out there from, you know, U47s to C12s, so, you know, any of the tried and true microphones. Of course, I think I had mentioned previously with with the Rush uh, recording, Rush that you know I'm I'm a really strong uh, Neve user, so you know Neve 1073s, 1081s, 84s, uh, 1066s, you know, and and really I like to uh, run like say for for guitars I will use uh, I will use like a uh, Mojave 301, I will use a Royer 121. And a Shure 57 or an SM7, and those three have really different frequency characteristics and how they're placed. And I use those three kind of like a three-band EQ, right? And minimal minimal EQ with the, using the knees, but then it's summed together, and you know might tweak it a little bit with uh, uh, something like a Poltec, like EQP Poltec, and then off to uh, probably an LA3 and out to Pro Tools. So in, in essence, it's a very simple signal path, you know, and it's really about mics and placement, you know, but LA2s, 1176s, you know, those are kind of the, the really the staples. And it's, I, I would love to tell you it's super eventful and I have, you know, a lot of super duper weapons going on for, for that, but it's really just using the right, right microphones for the job and then, you know, right pre's and super simple, clean, quiet. With mixing, I mean, I come from the era of mixing 48 track, two Studer 800 syncing together, uh, feeding an SSL, you know, and then printing back to analog. So I, I appreciate 
you know, that that sound character, I appreciate that. So it was always, you know, I'm from the track Neve makes SSL. And it's been something that's worked for, for me really well, uh, really well. And it was something that when I started to move toward uh, mixing in the box, that it was something that was really important to me that I maintained that essence for me. Because if, if I didn't have that, it didn't feel right. And there's enough software out there now that I feel uh, maintains the, that essence in my work and I feel comfortable with it, and I actually feel more uncomfortable with in the analog and highlights in, in uh in in the software any particular plugins that must have um, you it makes a great uh, SSL emulation uh as does Brainworks uh, Brainworks has the uh TMT uh their technology that emulates up to 72 channels of a uh, uh of console so it, you, when you're running it you're not getting identical instances across uh, multiple uh, multiple channels or buses. So there's enough analog error there that uh, uh, that's and it's cumulative. So it's something that's it's a very pleasing effect. You know, so definitely a lot of the uh, the SSL stuff from uh, from mixing, I mean anything from uh, you know capital chambers, the uh, uh, the RMX ATR 102 for tape emulating. Um, and and you know for any of these type of plugin for the plugins I'm mentioning, you know I've uh, I've had a long relationship with UA, and uh, you know I've written a lot of presets. That you know one of the gratifying things is when people call and say, "Hey, you know I used uh, you know I used wide snare and it sounds really uh, really awesome, man. Thanks." And and I appreciate that people are taking presets and and using them themselves and, and putting them in as part of their mix because. You know, it's it's one of those things that we used to have those on the the Lex 480, right? Where you'd say, you know, you had your stuff saved, whether it's Buck Ram or or uh, the A plate or something like that, and you'd have, you know, everything saved up to, that is done, and and it's great to be able to share that thing. These these used to be like industry secrets, right? I like that. Used to be industry secrets. I I won't say who the mixer was, but <laughs> I when I was an artist, I remember this particular mixer covered the console. Yeah, yeah, Isn't that crazy. And I know who, and I know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> covered the console, covered the effects. Yeah, I've, I've seen all that stuff. Yeah, you know, in the in the, in the grand grand scheme of things, if somebody wants to take you know rich chicky bass preset four and use it, you know, you're still at the mercy of the player. At you know what bass they used, and you know the performance and 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 the song, the density of the song and the style. There's so many variables that you know. Really, all all presets are they're, they're a starting point. You know, I mean, to take you know, I I know mixers that they use uh, analog equipment very much like plugins because they just it's it is the truest form of plugins. Analog, you plug it in, and you know they'll have their compressor set to stun, and it's just how hard you hit it is how much stun you get out of it, right? And and what where it's automated is in the send to the compressor. So, but but really the settings aren't changed, and that's fine and it works, right? But so there's no reason to. It, it's in our, in our application, our individual applications, right? We can send a song ten ten songs to ten people, and they'll all sound different. We don't all hear things the same way. Um, no. And yes, if I gave we both had the same pieces of equipment, we'd probably come up with two completely different results. Absolutely. Um, but it is interesting um, because you know there is these sort of tips and tricks. But I will say, I mean, obviously there, there are certain tricks or whatever, you know, or certain pieces of equipment. I remember when I first discovered like a DBX uh, 120 or, you know, the old disco boom box as it used to be called. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, that was life changing. I didn't know how to get the um, um, low end on a kick. And then right, right. the first person I ever saw using that was Dave Sardi. And it, it was the old Disco boombox, and I'm like, oh, that's how you get it, you know. It's uh, yeah, yeah. Furman used to make one. I can't recall the uh, the model uh, model of it. They used to make one that was it had a limiter built into it, oh, wow. and you could dr drive the snot out of this thing, mm -hmm. and it would just clamp down. Yeah. And, and but then when the limiter would release, right, you'd get this out of the kick drum, amazing, which was really really a cool effect. But you know, that's now how, how many. 
How many uh, how many sub generating plugins do you have? <laughs> I still try to use this if I'm working hybrid in, in the console sure. and mixing in the box. Um, oh, great! I recently just started using that BX one because it's free. I mean, right, I, right. I I own all the BX stuff anyway, but I've been um, and I just did a mix like a live mix using that because I like to showcase. If something's good and free, I can showcase it to people, and they can actually use it. Um, sure, sure. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a little, I'm a bit of an inverted snob. If I can find something which is great, cheap, or free, I'm gonna like push it because, you know, I, I, there's lots of really talented people out there who don't have big budgets. So, you know, I'm trying to help them. You know, sure, I don't sure. Want, I don't want music to only be made by by wealthy people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, a uh, a friend of mine who's a uh, is a very uh, substantial distributor of music equipment in Canada. He said that over the last uh, six months, since kind of since March, since the COVID meltdown, he said that the amount of people that are buying music equipment and just uh, recording at home and expressing themselves because, you know, there's everyone's, so many people's lives are being flipped upside down. And he said the amount of people buying music equipment to express themselves is, he said, it's off the charts how many people are buying, you know. And I, I'm, I'm going to assume that people aren't buying, you know, seven or $10,000 guitars, that the, there's going to probably be a really wide range of, of type of instruments people are buying. But, you know, it's people are buying what they can to, to express themselves. And it's... Uh, you know, it, it's about the it's about the emotion, man. Uh, how many times have we heard it? You know, crappy recordings that are hissy, and you know, from a technical point of view, you know, we you hear these things, and it just it just doesn't matter. Sometimes, you know, it's nice to have the you know technically accurate, but it's the generation of the emotion, right? Yeah, I agree. It's uh, the Quincy Jones saying, isn't it? It's about the song, the song, and the song. What are you, what are you working on at the moment? Are you doing a lot of mixing um, from home? You know, given the circumstances. Absolutely. Um, I'm upgrading a, a, a room. I just moved, so I'm building yet another room. It's going to be an Atmos room. I've been doing quite a bit of catalog work uh, in the past. So I've been doing some catalog work, uh, going back and remixing old masters into different formats, whether it's, you know, 5.1 or Atmos. And I can't really, uh, I, I don't want to proceed what an artist is doing. You know, if I think they need to press release before I start to get specific about anything I'm working on, but I did quite a bit of work uh, in the past uh, taking old masters and uh, cleaning them up, remixing in in 5.1 or some other format. So it's been something that's, uh, there's, I think there's an ongoing demand for that where people want to uh, revisit, uh, revisit music that's been um, reimagined, so to speak, into another, into a more updated format because, you know, listening environments are always changing. That must be quite a challenge, though, especially if you're if you're look, talking about maybe pre SSL recordings. You know, uh -huh. you're opening up, you know, eight, sixteen, twenty four track tapes, and sometimes they're hugely committed, and you just bring it up on fader, and you're like, there it is, there's the album. I mean, there's a lots of albums like that, but there must be other songs you pull up, and you're like, oh. This doesn't sound like the record. And then you've got to imitate, you know, what moves they may have done, what outboard they may have used. Well, and the funny thing is, is, uh, you know, when we've been discussing the analog and digital comparisons and this thing that you're talking about, like I had mixed uh, moving pictures for Rush in 5.1. And that was actually mixed on the, that was mixed, I think, on an SSL 4000B the precursor to the 4000E. And that console, uh, it was, when when I was doing that, it's like I had to learn, you know, what effects were used. I did some research on the studio was mixed at. And then it was, you know, listen with headphones, review reverbs. And, you know, you couldn't do something and say, hey, I'm going to use this 24-bit, 192K oversampled. Like, it just sounded wrong. Couldn't do it. You know, couldn't do it. It sounded wrong. So, you know, it literally was, okay, how do I take something that is so high quality and I'll use the word degrade, but it really to make it so it sounds old. And, and it, in essence, we are we're degrading the sound quality so it matches what was then. 
you know, because you know, you'd use, you know, dig- any anything that was digital then was 8-bit, maybe, 8-bit compressed, right? Right, yep. You know, 8K bandwidth, 6K, 4K maybe, you know, and then tape delays and all that sort of stuff. So it was a, a process that, you know, when it was done that, you know, I was really convinced as far as how accurate you could do, you know, analog emulations. You know, it's it's just that the idea of uh, maintaining the understanding of what the equipment was doing then and then adapting it to to the technology that's available. And, and that's a great thing. And plug-in companies are, I think, are getting a better and better grip on that. Uh, and that's what's making, uh, you know, the uh, emulations, you know, sonically be so substantial. It is interesting. I can't imagine going back to moving pictures, which is such an amazing record. Yeah, uh, I fanboyed so yeah. much when I listened to that the first time. Yeah, it must it, it must be quite a challenge because there's some stuff that I've heard that I am just completely blown away because you're just sitting there thinking to yourself, "Wow, this is everything that I remember and more." And yet, there's a couple of things like going back a few years, a couple of five one projects of some of my favorite music where I feel like they overthought it. Um, uh-huh. You know, it's it's interesting because, you know, when you're thinking about Atmos and 5.1 coming from stereo, we're listening to something in stereo and the vocal's in the middle. Well, it's not just really in the middle. It's coming out of both speakers. And I've heard some 5.1 stuff where they just put the, the vocal in just the one speaker in the middle. And that does not give you that same all-encompassing effect. No. And I, I'm talking about some famous 5.1 mixers and mixes. Sure. Without yeah. being specific, I'm sure you know what I mean. So yep. I, I think you have to be a lot smarter. Well, I think you, you knew better than me. You have to be a lot smarter in five one and Atmos because it's got to still feel like you're being surrounded by the singer. That's a really great point. Mixing for cinema five one and then mixing for music five one are not the same. And the concept of having dialogue in the center speaker uh, for uh, cinema—that's a given. That's a given, and. Uh, uh, and putting effects in the in the remaining four satellite speakers, that's a given, and there's a good reason. It works fantastic for music uh, to put what I, what I classify as core elements, which would be kick, snare, bass, and uh, lead vocal uh, as a small list of core elements, to just put those in the center, putting them in the smallest little speaker in the center, uh, is would generally be something that's, that'd be a very dangerous thing to do. So, I mean... My approach, love it or hate it, is is that I, I will use the center speaker as support, but I, I still use the phantom center from the left. So so my vocal is uh, notwithstanding any processing or effects that'll stretch out to the back or up in Atmos, notwithstanding that, I, I end up putting the uh, vocal with that's it's an LCR vocal. Great. Yeah. Right. But it's the combination that, you know, if I Pull the if I mute the center speaker, you know you can feel the mix jostles a bit, but it doesn't collapse because the uh, because the lead vocal is is gone hundred percent, you know. But I I do know that you know I do know mixers that prefer to have their uh, vocal only in the center speaker, and you know the great thing about mixing is that you know it's 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 an opinion, right? So you know, and the more speakers you add, the more you know, being in Atmos and you're in full 3D, you have so many options to put things in different places that, you know, we can, you know, you can really have, you know, 20, 20 different versions out there. And, and the super fans would go, oh, I prefer version 17. I prefer version one, you know, and, the, and all of them are viable, I think. I think, it's, a, I think it's, a, it's actually a great thing. Speaking of speakers... Do you have mm-hmm. a, and you're building your own Atmos room, what, do you have a preferred brand? I use the Ones by uh, Genelec. I'm going to be using a combination of Ones and uh, and the dual drivers uh, for for overhead, uh, partly because of, well, they sound spectacular, first off. And second, the, uh, the way that they integrate into an Atmos system is, uh, is the most elegant, the, the, the way you can align and be able to control levels and, you know, so it's really a really spectacular um, speaker and super, super accurate. And, and 
it's a, it's kind of a, a next uh, next generation from what the uh, like the ten thirty ones and that sort of thing. It's like the next step up from that. Absolutely, I still uh, those are a pair of ten thirty twos behind me. Yes, there you go, and they <laughs> sound great, right? I do yeah, and I did yeah. have the ones over here, um, and I loved them. I thought they were fantastic, but I just said to I said to my friend, I was like, I know these, and I know my room, and it's. But the ones sound. The ones have uh, a little bit more depth, don't they? They just seem to have a little bit more front to back to them. What I enjoyed about them is uh, when I would close my eyes and listen to a mix, I felt like I could, uh, especially on drums, that I would be able to go. Out, there's the hi hat, and got it. I felt like I could grab stuff that, and that imaging I find. Uh, that the it, I mean it's always critical, but when you get into three D like an Atmos, that feeling of placement when it's like okay now I want to grab stuff and I want to go up here and I you know you, it allows you to pinpoint placement really accurately, and uh, they're brutally unforgiving in that in so if I'm doing something wrong it re- they really kick my butt and tell me. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, this this has been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed this. I, me as well. I really appreciate the time. Thanks. You know, you're doing really, uh, you're doing really great work and, you know, educating people, keeping, uh, you know, keeping people active in the industry and they, they have, they've got a great information system to feed from. Thank you for being part of it and really, you know, sharing some great stuff. I really appreciate it. Pleasure, man. Hopefully we can do it again sometime. We will do. All right, everybody. Thanks ever so much for watching. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing and we'll see you all again very soon. Cheers. See ya.